and welcome to a special edition of Represent NYC. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. Tonight, we're going to examine the future viability of Donald Trump's presidency. Will it survive the legal scrutiny of the Robert Mueller investigation? The ongoing special counsel investigation has loomed over Donald Trump's presidency since his first year in office. And as Trump begins his third year in office, the pressure is escalating at a significant rate. Most recently, Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, has agreed to testify before the House Oversight and Reform Committee in February. Two months ago, he pled guilty in federal court for lying to Congress. He was sentenced to three years in prison and has spent considerable time with federal prosecutors and Mueller. It's also been reported that this month, that convicted campaign chairman and Trump fixer, Paul Manafort, shared polling data with a Russian official linked to their intelligence service during the course of the 2016 campaign. Trump, of course, denies knowledge of all of it. Okay, so what does all of this mean? And what does it mean for Trump's presidency? Are these legal breadcrumbs leading to impeachment? Let's discuss. Joining me now are political strategist Lincoln Mitchell, New York Times political reporter Jeff Mays, and Democratic pollster and communication strategist Matt McDermott. Thank you all for being here with me. Um, okay, so Lincoln, I'm going to start with you. Yes. Former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, convicted. Former national security advisor Michael Flynn, pled guilty. Former lawyer Michael Co Cohen, pled guilty, going to jail. What does this really mean? And does this get us any closer to impeachment? or some sort of understanding of how Russia played a role in the 2016 election? Well, it certainly gets us closer to understanding what happened in the 2016 election. The Mueller investigation and the report that will come out of that and at some point will become public will be an extremely important historical document to understand what happened. The impact it has on politics will be very different. The impeachment process is not a legal process, it's a political process. Mm -hmm. And the only question that matters there are to get the two-thirds to, to vote to convict in the U.S. Senate you need 20 Republicans. And until you can have 20 Republicans voting that way, there's zero chance of impeachment. And to get those 20, 20 Republicans voting that way, you're going to need Trump's popularity to be so low that he's vulnerable in Republican primaries. Right now, as long as Trump hovers around 30 percent, mm -hmm. any Republican who votes to impeach him, particularly if you're in a solidly red state, could lose a primary to a pro-Trump candidate. Mm -hmm. So the politics of this are not going to lead to impeachment. And just as a reminder for our viewers at home, it's the House that sort of votes on, on impeachment, and it's the Senate that votes on conviction. With a two, need of a two thirds. Exactly. And that's the key. Okay. So, Jeff, do you agree with Lincoln's analysis? Yeah, or? but I think the, an important point is what comes out of that Mueller report. So there's going to be a battle, right, of how much of that is public, how much of that is made public. Uh, once the report is released, like, what is Mr. Mueller going to do? Is he going to go out and discuss his findings? And I think that could play a huge role in whether uh, Mr. Trump's popularity dips low enough. Um, you know, if, if Mr. Mueller found, like, deep disloyalty to the United States in there, that could really hurt uh, any sort of approval for President Trump. And now you have Michael Cohen, his lawyer, who's going to uh, testify before Congress. So he was untruthful about uh, many things, federal prosecutors mm -hmm. said. Untruthful. So we, we still don't know what he's going to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may uh, get up before Congress and say things that we have uh, yet to hear. Hmm. What do you think, man? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think the, the question for me is really twofold is, should and can the president be impeached is, I think, one question. I think the other most important question is, can the House and should the House vote on impeachment? And I think those are very different questions. And I think there's a political piece of that and a historical piece of that. And I think the question facing Democrats, particularly in the House, is can they move past 2020, given what we know and given what we're soon to know out of the Mueller report, and not hold an impeachment vote in the House. Doesn't mean the president's gonna be impeached by any stretch, but that vote, I think, is an important symbol to the American people that Democrats care about the precedents here and care about making history and making it clear to the American people what has happened is not okay. So it's, it's fascinating, though, because the Democrats have to sort of thread two needles, right? Mm -hmm. If they go the impeachment route, they also have to put forward a policy position, right? It's not enough just to impeach, right. because I think a lot of Americans want to see some sort of substantive policy. But going back to something you said, Jeff, with this possible collusion, will this even matter to, um, say, 30 percent of the American okay. public? Will they even care if the president possibly colluded since, with an adversary? Since the moment he was elected, right, winning an election with a, not with a minority of the popular vote, and with only about 80 or 90 percent of those who voted for him saying they approved of him, right? Mm -hmm. Trump has never sought to do what most presidents do, which is build upon that to become more popular to pass legislation. 
What he's done is focused on red meat to that 35 percent to keep him loyal, because that's what keeps him, in plain English, not only from being impeached, but from being put in jail. And as long as that 35 percent, and that could be 30 percent, you know, the numbers are rough, believes that whatever Mueller finds is fake news, that's, that's Trump's goal. And you started this program by reading off a list. And because of time constraints, you didn't include everyone on that list because no. we only have no. half an we hour or so hour. <laughs> for this program. But yet, the, the theme that Trump keeps saying is that they've found nothing. And if any of you spent too much time on Twitter, as I have in the past, the Trump people are constantly saying, this is all a smoke and mirrors. They've found nothing. Of course, they found a lot. But they believe they found nothing. Mm -hmm. His goal is keep those 35% believing that if Mueller finds a signed a video of Donald Trump saying in broken Russian to Mr. Putin, I will do anything you want once I get elected, they will still believe that's fake news. Right. That's his goal. Yeah, and I think that's why you're right. That's why those attacks on the media, repeated attacks, have been so um, important. And I think how quickly Mueller's report actually comes out is also important. Uh, you know, Democrats are going to have to have a strong fight to release portions of it that they believe are really damning uh, to the United States uh, very quickly. And then again, um, once that comes out, the question is, you know, how does the president respond to this? If if they, they have really clear evidence that he colluded with Russia, you know, what does he say to these supporters? I know the, they're the diehards there, but I have to believe there's a portion of those people that are not going to be pleased um, if the president of the United States has been disloyal in any way to the country. No, really, I mean, because I, I really wonder if the horse has already left the barn, right? Because he has set up the frame that the media, people like you, uh, are the enemy, right? I mean, you know, because you're the elite New York Times. Enemy the people. And so... If if these things are true, you know where do, where does his base go? I mean, these are people who still think that the caravan is coming to Minnesota to take over their their lake houses and you know eminent domain. I mean, the framing that's been set up has been so um, consistent and intense. What yeah. is what no, and the polling I, been showing? Uh, <laughs> right. I, I mean, I think the elephant in the room here is we have a national presidential election in 22 months. <laughs> Uh, which is, I think, hard for a lot of us to believe. Um, but it's that, happening, Matt. But that's right, and that's the reality, is you can't win a national presidential vote with 35% of the American people. You just can't. And I think the challenge to the point that was made earlier exactly is that Trump has not done anything to grow that base since 2016, uh, which is a problem for him. And it's something that he has to do to be able to win in 22 months. And so... I think that's one piece of it. And I think the other piece, which actually benefits Democrats, uh, is this, is that the House can proceed on some of these investigations, potentially at some point on impeachment, um, and the national presidential contenders on the Democratic side can be holding that policy conversation with voters in Iowa and in New Hampshire. And so we can do both at the same time. We can be having a national conversation about issues that matter while the House is uh, working on, you know, investigative matters. Well, I want to follow up with you on that because I've always said Democrats need to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. But two questions for you. One, because this has gone on for so long, you know, and we know Americans have a relatively short attention span, right? Mm -hmm. Is, has it gone on possibly too long, um, and so will voters get tired of hearing about it? And two, where do Republican senators play a role in this? Trump only has 30 to 35 percent of his base, but we see, we've seen his Republican senators, the Mitch McConnells, the Lindsey Grahams, I mean, because of their fear of being primaried, have been sycophants yeah, in many absolutely. ways. I mean, they have not spoken up. So, and it, I, I mean, I think that the challenge they'll face in 2020 is the challenge they faced in 2018, which is this, it is impossible to be a Republican leader today in the House or the Senate and both uh, agree uh, and hold water and carry water for Donald Trump uh, and appeal to a majority of voters in this country. And so that's to the success of Democrats in 2018. What happened is Republicans are facing this problem now where they both have to advocate on behalf of an unpopular president and also appeal to 51% of voters. That didn't happen in 2018. It's hard to imagine how that changes between now and 2020. I think you're all a little more optimistic than I am. You mentioned that the 2020 <laughs> election is the elephant in the room. If that's true, the mammoth in the room is that Donald Trump, <laughs> the, woolly the woolly mammoth in the room, is that Donald Trump, and I've written a piece about this with my colleague uh, Jerry Goldfeder of the Daily News, is preparing to not leave office if he loses a close election. Mm -hmm. You will hear more noise about illegal voting as this election approaches. This Republican talking point, which you now hear on the far left, that, hey, Trump is a, is a strong candidate. Trump is a very weak candidate. 
in, in, in uh, 2020. His reelect has never really got, his popularity has never gotten about 42%. You don't win in that situation, but that story's out there. Mm -hmm. If this is a close election, he's not going to tweet out, congratulations, Senator so-and-so, I look forward to a peaceful transition. This is what makes America great. He's going to say, do not believe CNN fake news. Mm -hmm. And within 36 hours, the Republican leadership is going to get behind that. And, and the reason is not, is, is because, I use a different word, but they're co-conspirators here. Mm -hmm. Oh, Everybody, yes. this is, the, the one thing about the Mueller report to keep in mind is that while it will fill in, color in the lines and fill in the details, the basic knowledge of what happened has been out there in the political class for two years and the rest of the country for slightly less than two years. Everyone knows that Trump worked with Russia in one capacity or another, his campaign to win that election. Some people have built a fence around that in their mind and are denying that, and others are aware of it but know that the truth can't come out. There's not going to be any revelation. There already is the smoking gun. The smoking gun was out there by January of 2017. Right. And so we're also pretending, you know, that there aren't other elections that Russia can meddle with because... <laughs> because that's what they do. That's what they do, and that's and, what they, they've and been planning to do for a long time. anybody had been... I mean, where was the bipartisan committee, the bipartisan commission, the bipartisan legislation to make sure this never happened again? That, that alone, you asked for the smoking gun, that's a smoking gun. They want... So... We're not, 2020 is, we're not going to elect ourselves out of this crisis of American democracy mm -hmm. quite as easily as, as many think. Right, so I think it's time for us to brush up on you know, some foreign, foreign governments and how they've, they've negotiated that. So, Jeff, I want to bring you in and let's bring it a little bit closer to home with our new Attorney General, Tish James. Yep. Uh, Attorney General James has been very clear that she's going to go after Trump and the family and the foundation and the entities and the organizations. Um, how do you think she's going to be able to move the needle in this New York State context? Well, I think <clears throat> she uh, remains an important backstop, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and first, you know, there, there, there's been some uh, initial criticism of her for kind of being a little too public with mm -hmm. how she's going to go after Trump and, you know, whether that would damage her in a court of law, whether, you know, Trump has already tried uh, with the Charities case uh, to try to say that Eric Schneiderman, uh, former Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, had a political agenda against him. So, uh, you know, since uh, she's taken office, she's kind of toned down some of that Trump rhetoric, uh, which leads me to believe that she may be back in the office actually you know, putting together these cases. Um, I know that she is interested in following up on the charities case. She's also uh, interested in looking into the emoluments case. Um, so there, you know, it just seems like there's a lot going on with the president, not only from Washington, but you have a lot of the state attorney generals, the Democratic state attorney generals, have now banded together and are now tackling a lot of these issues. So he's in jeopardy from very different angles. Multi-prong approach. I mean, yeah. does and, that make and, him a wild animal in a corner, or and, how, does, how yes. does that play I mean, out? Bringing it back home <laughs> into New York, not only the Attorney General's office, but obviously the Southern District of New York and an ongoing investigation into criminal campaign finance violations mm -hmm. uh, that's still ongoing, even though Michael Cohen's been charged and is going to jail, uh, and he'll be testifying in front of the House uh, in the next week or two. And P.S., we keep saying jail. He's going to prison. Correct. Which is a difference. <laughs> there's a, there's a difference. There, is, yeah. there is a difference. Yes. <laughs> Fair. Uh, and so that uh, investigation is ongoing as well, uh, and one would surmise, because that investigation is ongoing, that there are other co-conspirators as part of that, uh, and I think we have an obvious understanding of who one of them might be. Um, and so there's a lot here, and I think the challenge for Democrats uh, is this, is that because so much is going on, uh, there needs to be a public conversation largely driven by Democrats threading the needle between all of this. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I think what we saw in 2016 it's is it's overwhelming, mm -hmm. and voters don't know what to focus on. Mm -hmm. There has to be a consistent narrative here, which I think is one, corruption, uh, and just abject corruption. And so I think the way they thread that needle is overlaying that conversation with their legislative agenda. I think it's why the House has pushed H.R. 1 uh, to sort of uh, put out there that Democrats have an anti-corruption uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and that, I think, effectively starts the conversation into, okay, what's happening on the other side? The, there are other states attor attorneys general as well. This is important because what that means is that if Trump ever leaves the presidency, even if he resigns and is pardoned by uh, President Mike Pence, types hypothetically, he still faces the prospect of a lifetime of legal hassles and eventually imprisonment. And what that means is that there's no easy way out. There's no way to ease him out. Even Republican leaders who realize they're better off with anyone else, they can't do this because he knows. And you can't ask 
an attorney general who's a Democrat in the state of New York to not go after him. Mm -hmm. People want that here. There's a demand for that. No Democrat, Tish James is going to only help her political career by going after Donald Trump. So you can't ask her not to do it. But that makes this even more complicated when we think of moving Trump out of this position. I think the stars are aligned here too, right? Because, uh, you know, Tish is in favor of uh, pushing a law that would allow her to prosecute anyone that the president pardons. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in Albany now, all, you know, the House and the Senate. Unified and government. The, yeah, mm -hmm. it's controlled by Democrats. So, you know, there's a chance that that sort of legislation could actually go through, which would actually give her the strength, the power to even be bolder in going after the president on some of these issues. Well, I think... What's so dangerous, which all of you have alluded to and spoken very clearly about, is that the frame, though, has been anything the Democrats say is sort of hypothetical and, you know, it's fake and he's the only truth. And so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the wall, the wall that Mexico will pay for, the wall that will be a big wall, will be a beautiful wall, will be a grand wall. Um, so I'll start with you, Matt. Um, how does the president get himself out of this bind? Nancy Pelosi has very clearly said, you're not getting the money, right? Mm -hmm. You said Mexico was going to pay for it. It's ridiculous. It's feasibly, anyone who's ever seen a map knows that, you know, topography says it can't actually happen. So she's doubled down and said, no, we've had some performance. We've had some slamming on tables. We've had some storming out. How does the president get out of this situation? Because he was elected as a, well, besides possible Russian collusion, but he was elected as a deal maker. Mm -hmm. I know how to go in a room and sort of get you to change your mind and I get money for it and... Everything always works out in my favor. And now we're seeing it on the national scene. This deal maker might not be who we, we said think. he was. Uh, no, no, Maybe I, we can't edit this out. I, like, I think the, the challenge for them is uh, what they see as a win versus what is actually a win. And so it seems obvious at this point that they are proceeding forward with this idea that the president can declare a national emergency. And they is? Uh, the administration. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and get his money. Uh, that will obviously be tied up in court for years. They'll never get the money through that. But the Trump administration seems ready to declare that a win and say that they got the win they need. Uh, I think the problem there is twofold. One, it's a politically horrible idea. Uh, it's an unpopular idea from an unpopular president on an unpopular issue uh, during an unpopular shutdown. Uh, so not great politically. I think the other issue for them is this opens up a huge can of worms for Democrats in the future to say, Healthcare is a national emergency. Gun violence in this country is a national emergency. Climate change is a national emergency. So we're gonna use the presidency when we get it to suddenly declare that there is money here to combat these things that we think are national emergencies. It's just a problem here that I don't see Republicans in the long term being satisfied with. Hmm. What do you all think? Trump has backed himself into a rather odd corner here because pounding his fist on the table and saying, I want a wall helps him politically. The worst thing that would happen for Trump is that he actually got the wall, right? It would be a waste of money. It would not solve any problems. He would have to bargain away something that Republicans, who actually do have conservative positions about immigration and about undocumented immigration and things like that, would be giving away something and getting nothing because the wall is useless. And by the way, when the, when the hammer meets the nail, so to speak, who's actually going to build that wall? It's going to be undocumented workers from Mexico. Right? Because the Republican contracting companies that through the inside deals are going to get these, they don't hire union workers. They're going to go with the lowest workers. Imagine that story. So the last thing Trump needs is this wall. He's backed himself into a corner. I think Matt's laid out a scenario that may be the only way out for Trump. And it's a matter of do you want to lose badly or lose terribly for the president. Mm -hmm. You have 800,000 federal workers who are not being paid. Mm -hmm. uh, you have farmers in Iowa who, you know, have tried to stand by the president, but now they're being hurt by the fact that the government is shut down and they're not getting the subsidies. So this is not good for him. Uh, the very people that he needs to keep in his corner are the people that are being hurt by this federal government shutdown. So the longer this goes on, the worse his bargaining position is. Let me just ask this question. So years ago, LBJ, my favorite president, said, if you can convince the poorest white man that he's greater than the Negro, you can pick his pockets all day long. Is this the 21st century version of Trump still trying to convince his base, and granted, they're not all poor, but that they're better than these immigrants who are taking their jobs or whatever the boogeyman is, and he's been able to make policy that has actually consistently hurt his base. So how does he, does he even get hurt by this in the long run? Because he can brag that he has the longest shutdown ever, 
right? Because that's secretly what he, he wants to, to talk about. I mean, where does his base go? Because they haven't left when he's talked about Mexicans, Muslims, blacks, Jewish people. I mean, the list goes on. We only have 30 minutes. Like, we can't even list the, the name of the people that he's insulted. So his base hasn't left yet. I, I might ask Will, they, will I, they even leave with this I'm when it hurts their own pocket? Rephrase that a little bit, which is that Let's say that the scenario that you've laid out is what happens. So everyone goes back to work, paychecks are gotten. Some people do miss mortgage payments, and that's mm -hmm. a real hassle. That's a real problem for mm -hmm. people. Other people can't pay for groceries for a couple of weeks. That's a real problem. And we want to make sure for, people know this isn't just people who are employed by the government. These are all the people who are around. The restaurants where government employees aren't coming in to eat. Contractors who aren't going to get back pay. Yeah. All of the right. things. Contract, yeah. but, but Babysitters, what, you name it. What, what I always say about Trump whenever one of these news items comes up is that one thing I'm pretty confident of is we won't be talking about it for three, in three weeks. Right? So will the base leave him? No, because in three weeks he'll be using uh, racial slurs against football players, just for example, or something similar. He'll find something else. He'll find some pop culture figure with whom to pick a fight. He'll be talking about something else. We will all be talking about something else. The one thing that Trump has been extraordinarily good at is setting agendas. We talk about what Donald Trump wants us to talk about. And if we settle this, this shutdown tomorrow, three weeks from now, he's not going to want us talking about this, and we won't be. So when you run on a white supremacist platform mm -hmm. and you give your white supremacist base fodder for that worldview, yeah, they're going to stay with you. They, they've cut this deal. The racism is more important than the economic, moving Realities. forward economically. Mm -hmm. we, we, we know that about, about Trump's v voters. Now, and some of these are affluent people for whom the racism, they can live with the racism if they get lower taxes. Mm -hmm. And I know these are unpopular things to say, but it's, it's largely, well, they're factual, not in this they're crowd, <laughs> but, um, but it's true. So, so yeah, it's, I don't think it's going to hurt them among them. Those no, and, and look, we don't, we don't need to talk about this in some sort of esoteric way anymore because we had 2018, is we had an election in which the president ran towards his base, talked about immigration, talked about these crazy, violent stories of immigrants killing white people, and they lost a historic margin in the House. That is not a winning majority strategy in this country. So if he wants to focus on that 35%, all the more to him, it's not a winning strategy heading into 2020. And we know that for a fact based on what happened in 2018. Even with the Electoral College, even with some major losses statewide. Well, you, it, it is not, and you're absolutely right about that. And, and if he were going at this as, I need to win a free and fair election, he'd be very, very foolish. But I think he's going at this as I need that when I say the election is false, there is enough support among Republicans and there is enough fear and my base gets agitated enough that I can stay in office. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain percentage of his base that has really made a decision that regardless of what happens to them financially or whatever, that this sort of xenophobia, racism is, is what they want to see mm -hmm. in this country. Um, and, you know, he has that base. He's going to continue to play to that, that base. I mean, if you looked at his uh, speech on television the other night, most of the statements were false or misleading about, you know, how drugs come into this country. Most I of like the drugs are not. lies, but <laughs> yeah, I know you work for the Times. For the Times is always like, you know, that's a misleading thing. I'm like, it's a bold faced yeah. lie. How about that? Well, the, you know, the, <laughs> drug, like a letter or something. the drugs are not coming in through the desert. They're coming in through, you know, regular ports of entry. Um, so, again, Again, the, the problem is whether people can process all of that. You know, this is a lot coming at people at once. You have mm -hmm. Russia, you know, what's happening with the government. And so I think people just need to take a look um, at, you know, what's happening, how is it affecting them. Um, and I think he's, he's in more jeopardy than I, than you believe to be. So, I think. I, mean, I think his presidency has been a crash course in civics for a lot of Americans, right? Because there's been an onslaught of so many different issues, local, state, and nationally, and somehow he's wrapped up in it. So, we can, we can talk about, unfortunately, Donald Trump for far too long. <laughs> for way but too long. For way too long, which he loves, which it's frustrates me. Um, exactly. Uh, his, his 15 minutes of fame has somehow lasted 40 years. But in these last five minutes, I want to talk about something closer to home. I want your thoughts on Mayor Bill de Blasio's State of the City speech. In it, he outlined a progressive vision for New York City over the next four years. But was it progressive enough? So, Jeff, I'm going to start with you yeah. uh, and our dear mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, I think this speech compared to the last two was much more energetic. He actually had some new ideas in here. It was, you know, he received a lot of criticism for these last two speeches where, you know, they were just kind of big picture, you know, Amusing. big thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he actually unveiled some new ideas in this speech, uh, one being the paid uh, time off requirement, the other being the uh, extending the health 
care for undocumented low-income New Yorkers. So I think he has to get credit for that. You know, a lot of people felt like he was much more energetic. Um, it's clear that he's trying to reinsert himself back into this national debate. Um, he clearly sees himself as a national leader on, these, on these progressive issues. Uh, we have a bunch of new progressives in, in Albany and Washington. So the mayor could be kind of positioning himself as a person who could set the agenda for these sort of people. Now, how successful it will be is unclear, because once you start looking at some of these proposals, such as uh, the health care proposal, it becomes clear that it's not as uh, huge as he uh, has said in some, some statements. Matt, did you hear anything new or interesting? Yeah, I mean, as a progressive myself, I'm asking myself where this Bill de Blasio has been for the last four or five <laughs> years. I think the challenge I see in this is it was a visionary speech. It clearly sets out an agenda that progressives have been looking for for a long time out of the city. I think the challenge is he's planning on going on a road trip. He's planning on taking this message nationally to, you know, he's been a fan of Iowa, been a fan of New Hampshire. And so I think the challenge is who's implementing this mm -hmm. policy? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have, you know, a mayoral election coming up in a few years. I think we're going to have a lot of credible candidates who can actually take this mantle and run with it. I don't see how this gets passed if Bill de Blasio is taking his message nationally. Like it. A couple of thoughts. It, it does seem that Bill de Blasio kind of went about this backwards, in that these proposals, if they'd been in year one, now you get into the second term and you can talk nationally about what you've accomplished, right? So that's, that's one piece. I think he got that a little bit backwards. But I also think that it's easy to overlook some of the accomplishments because of how much the world has changed. When Bill de Blasio ran in 2013, the, the first time, Michael Bloomberg was leaving office. Michael Bloomberg's signature approach was suing, you know, taking to the Supreme Court his right to harass uh, African American Latino young people, right? Mm -hmm. Bill de Blasio, in his speech yesterday, not about the things he would do, but talked about how not only has crime gone down, but the number of arrests have gone down. And that's the kind of thing that, frankly, if you're a middle aged, you know, white dude like I am, you could shrug off. But if you're a younger person of color, that's a huge deal. 100,000 plus fewer arrests. That's a massively big deal for real New Yorkers. And he did that while, not he single-handedly, and he gave the police department. A lot of people can take credit for that. But today, that's not considered radical anymore. Right. In 2013, that would be considered a radical approach to crime fighting. So the, the, the timing has changed here. And in regards to this timing, if you were, I don't know, the Colorado State you know, Democratic Committee or something like that, you're organizing a dinner, what New York politician do you want to come and give your talk if you want to sell tickets? Now, Bill de Blasio, it's not about him, but he's no longer that politician. Right. That's the new congresswoman from, from Queens. Alexandria so, Ocasio-Cortez. Yes, of course. And it's younger people. It's, and it's, it's more and it's, energetic. And, and not just in New York, but right. everywhere. Everyone. So he's, if, if I were, I mean, I think de Blasio's legacy could be being a very good progressive mayor. It's not going to be being a national figure. All right, so we'll see. Time will tell. He's got a new teleprompter, and so we'll see how <laughs> the implementation phase works, which is real, right? Because yeah. we're still talking about fair fares. I agree with you completely. He's done a lot. But with these new ideas, how will they actually get done when we know that his bags are packed and he's ready to go? Yeah. So that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching this special edition of Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.